How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Before we get started in our study in Jude, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer to give everyone the opportunity to make sure that they are in fellowship and ready to study the word. And then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for this opportunity to get into your word this time and to focus on the lessons here. Uh, Today is no different from the time of Jude. There are false teachers, uh, some believers, many who are not believers, who have infiltrated the visible body of Christ, the visible church, and have introduced so many more false doctrines than were probably even imaginable to Jude in the first century. And we need to stand firm. We need to contend for the faith. We need to know what the faith is. We need to know what truth is, and we need to stand firm, and we need to uh, contend without being contentious. We need to, uh, first and foremost, fight the battle within our own souls for the truth, and then within the concentric circles of our uh, of our involvement, whether it's family or whether it is in the local church or whatever the circumstance may be. Now, Father, as we study today, we pray that God the Holy Spirit would help us to understand these things, that we might be able to have a greater grasp of uh, history, of our role within the angelic conflict, and our role within the worldwide, universe, cosmic-wide spiritual conflict uh, known as the uh, angelic conflict or angelic rebellion, or also as spiritual warfare. And we pray that you would guide and direct us in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, last time we started looking at Jude verses 6 and 7, and these are important to take together. And today what I want to do uh, is go back and just review what we looked at last time briefly to bring us up to where we stopped last time, looking at the event in the Old Testament described in the beginning of Genesis chapter 6. Because what we see in Jude verses 6 and 7, as well as in 2 Peter and 1 Peter passages, is a reference to some dramatic uh, conflict in the, among the angelic hosts that resulted in a large segment of the uh, fallen angels being assigned to a place in uh, Sheol, where they were imprisoned in deep chains uh, or in chains of deep darkness, and this is it, uh, stated in uh, by Peter and Jude, and this is not their final ultimate judgment. It is a uh, holding cell for their future judgment before they are assigned to the lake of fire. And we need to understand this because there are some alternate views that are out there. And they, and it's amazing how you'll run into these, but we need to investigate the Scriptures and search the Scriptures in order to properly understand uh, what is being taught here, because this is very important. So Jude references this in verse 6. He says, "...and angels who did not keep their own domain." This word, arche, as I pointed out last time, means their uh, sphere of influence or power. This is their original uh, place in the heavenlies. They did not um, keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode. Actually, this is uh, Oketirion here relates to the translation of proper abode, not what is depicted in the slide uh, that didn't get changed. So it's Oketirion, their habitation. So they left heaven. Their original domain is their place among the angels, uh, positive to God, obedient to God. Their proper abode would be the heavenlies, and they left that to go to earth, it appears, abandon that proper abode, and they are kept in eternal bonds under darkness. Now, I want to say something here because this is going to apply at the end of, uh, of, the, of the next verse. At the end of Jude 7, I want you to notice they, they undergo, it's talking with reference to Sodom and Gomorrah, there's a reference to Sodom and Gomorrah un, 
undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Now, 99.9% of people immediately jump to saying that the eternal fire there is the lake of fire. Now, that's a question that has to be decided, but I just want to point out that the noun fire is modified by an adjective, a genitive in this case, uh, an adjectival genitive of eternal, fire of eternity. And this is the same kind of thing that we have here uh, in reference to the bonds. These are eternal bonds. But it's not eternal forever and ever and ever and ever because there comes a time when there these bonds will be uh, they'll be set free from these bonds to go stand before God in the final judgment of the angels, and then they're sent to the lake of fire. So eternal always, doesn't always mean eternal. Sometimes eternal means a long time. Sometimes eternal means uh, has to do with their origin. Uh, bonds of eternity, meaning these are these come from God as the eternal one. And it can also mean... Uh, for a time period within a certain age. So we have to evaluate the context and some other things before we immediately leap to the conclusion of eternal, everlasting, never-ending, never-ending judgment. So these angels did not keep their original domain, which is their place as angels, as the holy elect angels serving God, but abandoned their proper abode, which is he- which was heaven, and now they are in a holding place of judgment, described as eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And the word there for judgment, as I pointed out, is a word that indicates a deep, depressing doom. It's a heavy, gloomy darkness. It's not just the darkness in terms of the absence of light, but there's an oppressiveness uh, to, the dar- to the darkness. Now, this passage talks about the angels. Angels are the subject of the, of the, uh, of the verse. Uh, they did not keep their own abandon. They abandoned their proper abode, but the proper noun is angels, and it's in the plural. And this is important for understanding the next verse. It's a nom- It's a um, excuse me. It's a masculine plural noun. So when we get to the next verse, there's a comparison made between the sin of these angels and the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so the topic shifts from the first example of judgment to a second example of judgment. The first example was Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities. Cities is also a plural noun, but it is a feminine plural noun. So just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, that pronoun is a feminine plural, so it refers to the cities because there has to be agreement in uh, gender and number between the pronoun and the uh, and its referent. So uh, the cities around them, that refers to the cities, Sodom, Gomorrah, and the other cities of the plain. Uh, since they, that is the cities, again, it's a feminine plural uh, pronoun, in the same way as these. Now, this particular uh, pronoun shifts uh, shifts gender to a masculine plural. Well, the only masculine plural noun preceding this that it could uh, uh, re- that it refer could refer back to would be the plural noun of angels, angeloi. So, what this is saying is that Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh in the same way as these angels. So it is specifically stating that the area of sin uh, among these angels was a, was one of sexual sin and sexual immorality. And then there's a conclusion there that went after strange flesh are exhibited, that is, uh, in his argument, uh, Jude is bringing them forth as an example of those undergoing the punishment of eternal uh, fire, and so we 'll have to come back at the end and look at that uh, a little bit to see what that describes, but i don 't think it describes eternity in the lake of fire they 're not there yet for one thing it 's talking about present tense comes across in the English they are exhibited uh, as an example of undergoing punishment. This is again a present tense verb, and so this is talking about where it 's possible it could be talking about a future event. It is talking about present time, time Jude is writing, present time 
or a punishment, or it could be a punishment that has occurred already in the past. Um, so that would indicate that the fire here would be the fire, that, uh, the fire and brimstone that God sent down. Its source then would be from God, from the Eternal One, that God sent down on Sodom and Gomorrah. And I think that's probably the best interpretation because it fits the pattern of all these judgments, our pattern of punishment in time for the sins, not a future uh, punishment. I pointed out, too, that in Second Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, there's an indication of a, nut, of a major sin among the angels, that are cast into Sheol or Hades, committed to the pits of darkness, reserved for judgment. So again, we're saying the same thing as the Jude passage. They're held for a future judgment. And this occurs prior to the worldwide flood at the time of Noah. Second Peter 2.5 just continues the sentence. Again, Peter is uh, telling a warning of the future coming of the false teachers that Jude is, is talking about as a present reality. And so in Second Peter 2, 4, and 5, there's a listing of the same kind of thing, uh, God's judgment on those who have been disobedient in the past. So this places this angelic uh, issue, this angelic con- crisis, this angelic um, uh, rebellion, in the context of the Noahic flood and prior to the Noahic flood. Now, in 1 Peter 3.19 and following, there's also a reference to this. Uh, after the time of Christ, Christ's uh, uh, death on the cross uh, and the resurrection, during which time, before the resurrection, that is, I mean, bet- before the resurrection, his bodily resurrection, he went to the went to Sheol and made proclamation to the spirits, and that's a term related to angels. So this is talking about a group of angels who are in prison. So this would be the same group identified in uh, first in Second Peter as well as in Jude, and they are then described as those who were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah. So this uh, links that angelic. Uh, problem, that angelic crisis, that the punishment of these fallen angels and their activities to the time of Noah, and it would be preceding the before the flood. So that can take us only to uh, one event, and that seems to be what is described in Genesis chapter 6. This is the only event that could really fit it. So let's take a look at this because it's important to understand this within the overall scope and plan and purpose of uh, biblical history and understanding something about the angelic conflict. This is very important to understand how Satan is constantly trying to invade human history to block God's plan of redemption and God's plan of fulfilling his promises to the Jewish people. We see one major assault on the human race that took place in the Garden of Eden. Uh, This is uh, uh, described in Genesis chapter 3 with Satan's temptation. We see a second major attack uh, that takes place here in Genesis 6, and then there's another major attack that takes place a series of attacks that take place during the tribulation period. Now, Genesis 6.1 says, It came about when men, that is mankind, the human race, Adam in the Hebrew, when mankind, when the human race began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them. Now, if you look at the context, what we have in chapter 5 is a genealogy. Now, these genealogies are important and significant because these genealogies take us through uh, the, the lineage of the Messiah. God promised to uh, Eve that, that her seed would defeat the seed of the serpent, and so this follows and traces the lineage, the seed of Adam. And so it, we follow the seed of Adam through two lines. There's the line of Cain, that's given at the end of chapter 4, and then the line that goes through Seth. Now, if we look look at these, we see that only males are mentioned in the line of Cain. 
And when you look at the line of, of Seth, that there are, again, males and some, um, um, there's some women mentioned, um, excuse me, women mentioned in the line of Cain, um, Zillah for one in verse 22, and, um, and <clears throat> that she uh, is married to um, uh, Jubal and uh, Jabal, the twins there. So anyway, we'll look at that in just a minute. And it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, so it makes a distinction between daughters that are born to men and the sons of God. This is very important to understand this distinction that it's talking about the daughters, it's talking about a group of females, and then the sons of God are treated as the males. That The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. So this is clearly talking about one line, one group of women, and one group who are male. Uh, the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves. So it is talking about a group of males who are taking wives for themselves. So it's a one-way pattern. It is men in one group taking women in another group. It's not men. Uh, it's not women in the first group also taking. Uh, men from the second group. It's always males in the first group, the sons of God, taking women from the daughter, daughters of men. Now, the key issue in understanding this, as I pointed out last time, is this phrase, sons of God, which in the Hebrew is b'nei ha Elohim. Here, that the ha before Elohim is simply the article in the Hebrew. Sometimes it's b'nei Elohim, sometimes b'nei ha Elohim, uh, depending on uh, the the um, writer, but the it, it, it's important to understand this is a technical term. It's not B'nai Yahweh, it's not B'nai Elim, which is another name for God. We have to look at this particular struct, uh, construction, this particular term, and it always refers, uh, I believe, to angels. But there are three basic interpretations that are set forth for understanding this particular episode. And so we have to evaluate these and evaluate these these terms in order to uh, make sure we're properly handling uh, Scripture. The first view is that these are apostates, uh, and the... Um, this view then looks at the term sons of God as referring to those in one group. Usually it says these are the descendants of Seth. These are the Sethites, and these are all believers. And, um, and that what the problem is is they're intermarrying with unbelievers. Now we understand from passages in the New Testament that, that it is wrong for believers and unbelievers to intermarry not because it creates a crisis in the human race, but because uh, you have people with two different perspectives on reality uh, living together. Scripture says if two people can't um, uh, agree, how can they walk together? And so when you have uh, believers marry unbelievers, it's always a recipe for disaster. They can get along as, bo- as long as both of them are operating on carnality, and if they l- both live their life in rebellion against God, then they can have probably a fairly uh, happy marriage. But it's not going to be a, a God-honoring marriage, and it's ultimately going to be self-destructive because God is not part of the marriage. So there, that is true, but that's not the issue that's going on here. I don't believe the evidence uh, supports that. What we uh, see in this particular view is that the sons of God uh, is, is said to stand for the descendants in the Seth line, and the daughters of men relate to descendants in the Cain line. This is the view that the daughters of men then are spiritual apostates. That the daughters of men then are uh, spiritual apostates. Uh, this view s- attempts to use phrases that we see in some passages, such as uh, Israel, my son, or my firstborn, uh, sons of Yahweh in Deuteronomy 14.1. Uh, the phrase children of God in Deuteronomy 32.5, and many others to try to argue that um, 
uh, that this use of B'nai Ha Elohim is um, you can refer to human beings as well. However, in each of those phrases, it's a very different phrase, phraseology than the one that we have in Genesis chapter 6. So let's identify some of the problems with this particular view, why it just can't worry. In fact, uh, it, it sounds good. I had uh, several uh, professors when I was in seminary who took this view. It was interesting that that in the uh, what they call the English Bible Department at Dallas Seminary or the Bible Exposition Department now, uh, there were uh, several different professors, one of whom became, later became president of Dallas Seminary for a while, um, uh, Dr. Campbell. And in many ways, Dr. Campbell was a very good Bible teacher, but he did not take the, the sons of God uh, and, uh, as angels, fallen angels view, but everybody in the Hebrew department did. We always thought that was kind of amusing that in, um, there were people on the faculty outside of the Hebrew department who took other views, but people, everybody in the Hebrew department was consistent that B'nai Ha Elohim referred to angels, and this had to be angels, and you had to a- accept that. Now, one of the problems with this Cain uh, line versus Seth line is that this makes it a one-way problem. It's not just an intermarriage between believers and unbelievers, but it's an ma- intermarriage between male believers and female apostates. And the apostates come just from one genealogical line, that is Seth, I mean uh, Cain's line, and the sons of God would be male believers in the uh, line of, of Seth. So th- this, to me, one of the problems with this is a failure to appreciate the size of the population uh, during this time, because you have a worldwide population that has grown through about 10 generations now, and as we study through these various generations, we see that they live to be almost a 1,000 years. And so as we count through the various generations, maybe 12 or 14, I can't remember the exact number of generations, but as you go through there, you realize that each of these uh, members of these generations are living to be 800 to 900 years of age, which means you have seven or eight generations living together at the same time. Adam only dies about 400 years before the flood. He lives for over a uh, for an, over 900 years. And because you have um, so many more uh, generations living together at the same time, because you didn't have as many uh, health problems and therefore early death and other factors, you had a lot of people on the earth that did not take long for the, for the population to expand. And if you have a family, you have a uh, mom and dad, and they just average four children... Uh, I believe uh, Henry Morris in his book, uh, The Genesis Flood, and also in his book on, uh, on uh, commentary on Genesis, the Genesis record, worked out the number conservatively speaking, if you have four children for every family. Now, at this time, when your uh, period of fertility uh, within a, uh, a marriage would probably last 200 or 300 years, uh, families had many more children than just four. I know that not long ago in our own history in the United States, back in the 19th century and even early 20th century, it was not uncommon for families to have 15, 16, 17, 18 children. In fact, when I had my uh, my very first pastorate was down in a a small uh, city down on the coast just, just before you cross over to Galveston called Lamarck, and I had three or four uh, older people in my church at that time, this was in the early 80s, and there were three or four older people in that church who were part of families that had 15, 16 children. They were in their 80s. Those folks were in their 80s at that particular time, so they were born in the uh, early part of the 20th century. On my, I think on my grandmother's side, there were uh, five children, and on my grandfather's side, I think there were six or seven children. So even in that generation, which was born in the 1890s, there were an excess of four children. So, so it's very conservative to postulate four children per family. 
And if on the basis of those figures, Dr. Morris worked out the world population at the time of the Noahic flood to be approximately three and a half billion. Now think about that. That wasn't that long ago. In fact, when uh, just about 20 years ago, the Earth's population was somewhere around three and a half to four billion. Now it's up over six billion. But the world's population back in the 70s or 80s was about three and a half billion. That's a tremendous number of people. And to say that this entire number of people is divided into two classes and the believer be, that the line from uh, Seth is all believers and the line from Cain is not believers is just ridiculous to even assume that, especially when the picture that is presented here is that the uh, people upon the earth are becoming more and more reprobate and spiritual rebels. So not everybody, even in the Seth line, would become uh, believers or were positive to God. So it's a very simplistic view that doesn't seem to fit some of the facts. So this one-way problem of only males in one line marrying apostate, spiritually apostate women in the other line uh, seems oversimplified and doesn't really seem to fit the circumstance. Second problem is that the context of the passage suggests that only eight people survive. Clearly states that Noah and his wife, his three sons and their three wives, that's a total of eight. These are the only believers on the planet. Now, just prior to this, uh, Methuselah dies within a year of the beginning of the flood. And so there were other believers on the earth during this hundred-year period between God's calling of Noah and the completion of the ark and the beginning of the flood. But they were of a much older generation, and they were dying out during that hundred-year period, so that by the time the flood began, the only believers that were left on the planet were uh, Noah and his family. So again, that shows that that even from the descendants of... of uh, of Seth, most of them were apostate by the time you got uh, three quarters of the way from Adam to the flood. So the context suggests that only eight survived the flood. So there are only eight believers by the time uh, of the flood. So sons of God would be reduced to a, a, a meaningless number, just a few. It would have just been those four. And everyone else on the planet would have been a, a daughter of men unless they were an unbeliever. It just is a, is a not workable situation. Third, in that context, the daughters is made to refer to descendants of Cain. But contextually, daughters are never mentioned in that line, uh, though there were daughters. Uh, there's a couple of wives that are mentioned, as I pointed out earlier. But daughters are, are only mentioned in the Seth line, and in the Seth line, they're mentioned uh, nine times. For example, in verse 22, after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So the fact that they had uh, sons and daughters, for example, Seth, in verse 4, after he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. So the fact that daughters are referenced contextually uh, are mentioned where only in the Seth line, where there's no mention of daughters in the Cain line. Now, there were daughters, obviously, that were born, but contextually, daughters are, there's a focus on daughters only in the Seth line. So it doesn't make sense that now all of a sudden, the daughters of men it would be a reference to the daughters in the Cain line when there's never been a, a um, emphasis on daughters in the Cain line within the, within the text itself. And fourth, the term sonship, uh, the terminology for sonship outside of Genesis uh, relates to the privileged position of Israel as a theocratic covenant nation. So uh, sonship is, uh, uh, the idea there relates to Israel later on in, the, uh, in Genesis. So again, it just doesn't fit the idea of sons, of sons of God to try to make it mean one thing here and something else somewhere else just doesn't work. Unless you take the term, the point I'm making here is unless you take the term sons of God as a technical term for a class of created beings. 
as it's used in other places in the in the Old Testament. So that really doesn't work. Uh, the major problem, though, is that B'nai Ha Elohim or B'nai Elohim always refers to angels, angelic beings, fallen or elect, both are included. It refers to a class of being. And the reason is because angels are created directly by God, uh, whereas human beings are called the sons of Adam because we're all generated through procreation the same way, and we can all trace our lineage back to Adam The angels do not marry, they're not given in marriage, they don't procreate, and so there's no no baby angels created. So every angel was directly created by God, so in that sense, each angel is a son of God. And incidentally, angels are always presented as male. They don't have male as angels in their angelic, immaterial body, they do not have uh, uh, procreative organs. They don't have sexual organs. They don't have sex, sexual identity as human beings do. They were not created male and female, but they're always presented in Scripture as a with masculine nouns, and whenever they transform themselves into a mortal body, it's always a masculine body, a, a male body. Now, the second option that's presented, this is really a minor minor view, although I've been surprised by some of the people who've held this. Sometimes I think there are some theologians who just want to, uh, just want to be different. They just want to come up with an odd view, and uh, uh, they just want to be known for that, so they take an odd view. This is somewhat of a, of a minor view, but it is one that, it, that is often uh, stated in uh, commentaries. And this is that the term sons of God really refers to dynastic rulers or tyrants. And so they were referred to as as sons of Elohim uh, in the same way that a couple of passages in in the uh, Psalms refer to uh, human leaders and aristocrats as Elohim, lowercase gods. Um, Jesus referenced a couple of those passages uh, a few times when he was on the earth. So this view says that there were these dynastic dictators, these tyrants that forced uh, young, beautiful maidens to marry them, and they developed huge harems. Now, this has its own problems. Number one, there's no documentation that the term sons of God, B'nai Ha Elohim, anywhere in the Old Testament is used to refer to dynastic rulers or tyrants. It doesn't happen. Uh, I mentioned just the use of Elohim as a use in the Psalms a couple of times, but not B'nai Ha Elohim or B'nai Elohim. Second, in the alleged support for this view, uh, the judge that they uh, point to, uh, where the judges are referred to in the Psalms as Elohim. The judge is called that because he's a representative of God. But in Genesis 6, the, son, uh, the, the, the sons of God is a reprobate who's doing committing some evil. So in the Psalms, they, they're, they're saying that, that uh, their example is of someone who represents God, but here it's somebody who is opposed to God, so that creates a conflict. Uh, to get around that, they try to make it, uh, to understand this as a description of class. Sons of God refers to, they would say, refers to a class of individuals. But then they, uh, and so this class of individuals here is negative. But then they want to use Elohim in a positive sense. So they're, they're, they're shifting the meaning of terms. In one sense, one way they, the, the term is positive, and then they turn around and use it in negative. So there's, it's like a shell game, and you have to uh, watch that as they uh, manipulate the language. It's either one or the other. You can either use Elohim in a positive sense or a negative sense, but you can't switch back and forth. Now, there are two problems that neither of these two interpretations address. Uh, The first is, why is it necessary to wipe out the entire human race except for eight people? They just don't explain that. There's no authorization for that. And, And I would think, even though I know this isn't always true, but I would think that that um, in a lot of cases, people who would hold to the 
uh, to the uh, uh, apostate daughter's view would probably go more with a limited flood view than a worldwide flood view. But that's not always the case. You can't make that as a blanket statement, but I think it would be more true than not. And secondly, it ignores, the, both of those views ignore the evidence uh, from the epistles of Peter and Jude. They can't correlate that. But this is a problem that we have, I think it's part of academic arrogance. It's a problem that we have in a lot of seminaries and among a lot of academicians because they, don't, they, they get this, this view that's become more popular in the last 50 years that you just interpret a passage within its immediate context or within the book. You can't interpret Genesis in light of what's said in the New Testament. You have to interpret it only in light of what the people in the original context would have understood. But see, there was a lot of other revelation that was available to them at that time that was not inscripturated, that's not in the canon. So we don't know what else they knew. Obviously, they knew other things. Uh, One example of this kind of thing is that the only place we can go to for sure in the Bible to identify the serpent in the garden are passages in Revelation uh, that talk about uh, the dragon as being the serpent of old. Well, that clearly identifies Satan as the dragon in Revelation with the serpent in Genesis 3. But you have people who come along and say, no, 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 no. You can't interpret Genesis 3 in light of Revelation because Revelation's not written for several thousand years after uh, Genesis was written. And so the people wouldn't know that. But but that's begging the question. It's It's a logical fallacy. But this is the kind of nonsense that goes along in uh, academic circles and I think is just evidence of, of, of these academic uh, of academic arrogance. So then we come to the third view and the third view is the view that the term sons of God is always a technical term for angels, uh, whether they're fallen angels or demons and that the, there was a group of fallen angels, who left their original place in heaven, uh, managed to transform their human body into a, uh, or tra- transform their angelic, immaterial body into a hu- mortal human body with mortal human function, and seduced uh, young women and and married them to produce a genetically corrupt offspring. And this view then goes further and says the purpose for this was to try to destroy the ability of God to fulfill his promise to uh, Eve that the seed of the woman would defeat the seed of Satan. So Satan is attacking the seed. Now, this isn't the only way he attacks the seed. There were times in... Uh, the, during the Old Testament, after the Davidic covenant, when Satan sought to completely wipe out and destroy the house of, of David. And at one point, this got down to where there was only one survivor, and that was Josiah. And he was hidden uh, in, the, in the temple until he grew to maturity. So there are, uh, there's more than one way in which Satan tried to wipe out the seed lineage. You have the seed of of Adam, then the seed of Abraham, and the seed of uh, the seed of David. And today, this is why Satan is engaged in anti-Semitism and the destruction of the Jewish people, because he knows that God has not yet fulfilled the promise to bring them to the land, to restore them to the land, and to bring in all of the promises related to the kingdom. And if if Satan can destroy all of the Jewish people then God can't fulfill his promise, and Satan will think that he, thinks that he can win that way. That's the only way left to him. Uh, so there are different aspects to this. So in this view, uh, Satan is trying to corrupt the seed, destroy the purity of human DNA to block uh, God's plan for the cross. Now, one objection that often comes up from people is, well, the Bible says that, that angels don't marry, they're not given in marriage. Yes, but it, first of all, and that's in Matthew twenty-two thirty, where Jesus says, "In the resurrection," that He's talking about the human race in the resurrection. 
in the future kingdom, in our resurrection bodies. They neither marry nor are given in, in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Now, this does not address sexuality at all. It only addresses marriage. But we can draw, I think, an inference that this means that that in heaven, uh, because there's not marriage, there will not be a uh, sexual role for human beings like the angels. But that does not mean that angels couldn't take on some human form with a means of, of uh, human procreation. Now, let me give you an example of how angels have taken on a uh, human form, a mortal body, with mortal function. And this is in Genesis chapter uh, chapter 17. In Genesis chapter 17, we ha- or 18, uh, God comes to, to visit uh, Abraham. And God comes with uh, two angels with him, and we learn their identity later on in the chapter that they are angels because these are the ones that leave and go on to uh, warn Lot in Sodom. In Genesis 19.1, we're told, Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. So it's clearly there's the Lord and two angels. And so as they're walking to where... uh, Abraham is um, camped out at the terebinth trees at Mamre. As he was sitting in the tent during the heat of the day, he lifted his eyes and saw, saw three men coming, standing bef- before him, and he runs from his tent to meet them, bows down to the ground. Uh, he, there's no indication here that he understands that they're supernatural beings, so they appear to be human. And he brings them water, verse 4, let water be brought to you, let me wash your feet, Uh, rest yourself under the trees, I will bring bread that you can refresh your hearts. So they're eating, they're drinking, they have these uh, normal human mortal bodily uh, 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 capabilities. And so we can extrapolate from that that they would have other things. They have a huge meal and they rest. All of these relate to certain functions of a normal human body. So we can extrapolate that, that they could do other things as well. Uh, It has been suggested that from the basis of logic, because this kind of thing never happened again with the angels, never uh, invaded the human race, that God restricted that ability and did not allow that again after Genesis 6. That's not stated in the text anywhere. It's a logical inference, and I think it's a, a valid inference. But we do have some very clear uh, lines of evidence to follow in the Scripture. First of all, the term B'nai Elohim or B'nai Elohim, as it's used in Job 38.7, is always used of angels, and it's never used of anybody else, not once. You have passages like Job 1.6, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. This refers to all of the angels, the entire body of angels coming before uh, the Lord. Job 2.1 says it's another time, another occasion, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself, present himself before the Lord. And in Job 38, 7, when the morning stars, a term for the angels, sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. This, in the context, God is saying, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Where were you when I spread out the stars over the heavens? And when I did this, this is when the stars, the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So it shows unity among all of the angels. This is before the human race is created. Now, we also know that <clears throat> there are some variants to this term, and some of these show up in other passages. It's not B'nai Ha Elohim or B'nai Elohim, but it is a phrase, B'nai Elim. Now, this phrase refers to the angels also given to the Lord, O you mighty ones, B'nai Elim, given to the Lord glory and strength. Uh, Psalm 89, 6, for who in the heavens uh, can be compared to the Lord? Uh, who among the sons of the mighty, again in the Hebrew, it's B'nai Elim, uh, can be likened to the Lord? Uh, so this is, again, an example 
of this term even as a, a, a slight modification that it refers to uh, to angels. Now, one theologian today named Wayne Grudem, who is, uh, I think he is the president of uh, Phoenix Seminary now, uh, used to be a theolo- used to be on the faculty at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, has written a systematic theology, and in his section on angelology and demonology, he attempts to argue that the term "sons of God" was not always a technical a technical term for angels, and he cites as a reference Deuteronomy fourteen one, but he forgot to check the Hebrew there where it doesn't say B'nai Elohim or B'nai Ha Elohim, it says B'nai Yahweh, which is a term for Israel as the sons of Yahweh, using Yahweh because he's the God who he entered into a covenant with, uh, with Israel. It's interesting also that in uh, non-biblical literature, in extra-biblical literature, in surrounding culture there are... Um, there are cognate expressions similar to B'nai Elohim or sons of God that are used to speak of supernatural beings, used to speak of the gods, used to speak of a convocation or assembly of these gods. So this shows that there was sort of a, a distortion of this term that still was reflected in the language of the pagan culture surrounding uh, Israel. Now some people try to also say if angels are meant here, why isn't the normal term for angels, malaak, used? And the answer is that uh, malaak is used exclusively in Scripture to refer to the holy or elect angels. These are not holy or elect angels, so the writer uses a term that can describe either holy angels or uh, fallen angels. Um, the malaak are messengers of God, the ones who carry out the mandates of God. As we have also seen, there are many places where the term sons of are used in the Scripture. Usually it's not literally translated, but the significance is there are places where uh, people are referred to as the sons of Belial. uh, They are uh, uh, destructive, they're liars, so they are like Belial. So they're called sons of Belial. They're not literal descendants of Belial, but they manifest his his uh, his attributes and his characteristics. Uh, sometimes someone is called a murderer, but in the Hebrew it says a son of a murderer because he manifests the characteristics of a murderer. And in First Kings twenty verse thirty five, there's a uh, we see the term sons of the prophets. A certain man of the sons of the prophets, and what this is talking about. This is a man who is a prophet, so he partakes of the characteristics of prophets. And so this is a term to indicate a particular group or class of individuals. This is the way uh, the term sons of God uh, would be used. Uh, <clears throat> this terminology is also used in, in Canaanite mythology for the council of the gods. And uh, sometimes this is brought over uh, and uh, or, or you see a similar, not brought over, but we see it something similar in in the in the Hebrew language because the Canaanites spoke a a, a related form uh, form related to Hebrew, very similar Semitic language, and so we see some certain parallels. Uh, for example, Psalm eighty nine five, the heavens will declare your wonders. Well, the heavens is talking about a physical spatial area. Uh, the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness, that's parallel to your wonders, also in the assembly of the holy ones. Assembly of the holy ones is parallel to the heavens. The heavens is where they exist. The uh, holy ones are the occupants. These are the angels. Uh, Kadshim indicate those who are separated unto God to serve him are the holy ones. So here it's a reference to angels. Um, you see another example in Psalm 89, 6, at the bottom of the slide, for who in the skies is comparable to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty? B'nai Elim. Here again we have a term very similar to B'nai Elohim, and it refers to the angelic hosts. Uh, Psalm 89, 7, God greatly feared in the council of the holy ones, that's Kadshim again, and awesome above all those who are around him. So it's talking about this group that surrounds God 
in his uh, throne room. This is a very similar picture to what we see in Revelation 4, 1 and 2 of the 24 elders and the four living beings who surround God. And so uh, Revelation 4, 2 says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and on the throne one sitting. This is God the Father. And Revelation 4, 4, around the throne, 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. So you have uh, two groups there, the uh, group of the living beings who are immediately before the throne, and then the 24 elders who represent who are representatives of the entire body of the uh, of, of the church? Now, another objective uh, objection that comes up is that the word Nephilim, which is used in uh, Genesis six, is used also in the post-flood environment of Numbers. Let me go on. Go back to Genesis six, and we read in verse four in the uh, King James. It states, uh, there were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Now, the Hebrew word that's used here for giants is the word Nephilim. Uh, Nephilim, it, uh, we're not sure of its etymology. It could re- be related to the noun uh, Nephel. Uh, which would mean an, which means an untimely birth or a miscarriage. So this would kind of uh, be the idea of creating a monster, that idea. And it could also uh, relate to the noun pull, which means to be strong or mighty. It is not a technical term. Now, some of you have been taught that this is a technical term, but Nephilim is not a technical term. It was just a, a, a vocabulary word that meant these were mighty men, and it could apply to any group of individuals. And uh, it's not a technical term. It just says that they were, and it could be just a word for saying there were monsters on the earth. There were these uh, superhuman monstrosities on the planet. It's not a technical term. Now, remember, Moses is writing this. When did Moses live? Moses lives in around 14, uh, from about 1480 when he's born, probably earlier than that, about uh, 1500, excuse me, uh, 1500, maybe maybe 1520 when he's born because he's 80 years old when the uh, Exodus occurs in 1446. And then he dies in about 1406. So he lives to be 120 years. So he's probably born around 1520, 1526, something like that, uh, uh, B.C. When did the flood occur? The flood occurred approximately 2800 B.C., uh, something like that. So this is a long time before Moses. When did the these events take place? Prior to 2800. We're talking about 3000, 3100, 3200 B.C. Moses is writing after the flood, he is using vocabulary after the flood to refer to something that occurred before the flood. Now, there's something similar that happens in in um, in, in history, and that is when people. Uh, are traveling or moving from one location to another. For example, uh, the pilgrims who uh, moved from England to Massachusetts and the, the Puritans that came when they arrived in the New World, they named their cities after cities they were familiar with back in England. They were familiar with the uh, Thames River in London, and that always uh, <coughs> kind of made me gag when I was living in Connecticut because they have the, the major river that flows out of Norwich and goes down by the uh, New London subbase is spelled T H A M E S, but they, they don't. They've just completely corrupted the pronunciation. They call it the Thames River. I just gagged on that, but they also have Versailles up there instead of Versailles. So you just, if you were educated, you just had to bite your tongue uh, because they didn't know how to pronounce anything. But they had New London, they had Boston, they have Cambridge, they have Norwich, all these different cities 
are, are in the, in New England are named for cities uh, that they came from, and so you have vocabulary that changes its meaning. And so, what it, what we see here most likely is a situation where in a uh, at the time of Moses, there is this vocabulary word for monsters, for just uh, uh, the, these oddities that uh, are beyond uh, description, these giants, and it's just a generic term. It's not a term that inherently means a, a half-breed between angels and human beings. And that's the only way you can explain this, in, because in Numbers 13.33, when the spies went into the land, they saw the giants that were there. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. In the New American Standard, it transliterates the word to Nephilim and says, well, we saw Nephilim there. Well, if you start off by saying Nephilim means something that there's no documentation for, and that Nephilim means a half-breed angel and human, then you have a problem. But there's nothing inherent in the etymology or context or anything to make it a technical term meaning that. If it's just a word for a giant or a monstrosity, something like that, then the word can refer to uh, one, cat, one type of monster or giant before the fall, and it can refer to other giants uh, later on. It could be that the word Nephilim was a term that was used before the fall to describe that class of being, and then since that class of being, this half-breed, didn't exist anymore, when you get over into uh, later on in, in Israel's history, they see these monsters and they don't really have a term for them. So they say, okay, we're going to call them Nephilim because they're probably something like what occurred before the fall. So we're going to take this old name and we're going to apply it to this new kind of creature. That's what I was illustrating by the... Uh, use of, of uh, city names from England being transferred to the New World. Uh, but it's very clear that the Nephilim that are being talked about in Numbers 13 are human beings. They're not a crossbreed at all. There's no indication of that whatsoever. But the Nephilim of Genesis 6 were clearly the product of this angelic uh, sons of God union uh, with the daughters uh, of, of men. And so now we go back to our passage in Jude, and just to wrap this up, in Jude 7, what we see is that, that the sin of the angels is clearly related uh, to the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah as sexual immorality, and the punishment that occurs there is the same kind of punishment that occurred for Sodom and Gomorrah. And in uh, Genesis chapter 19, uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is clearly described as a, a destruction of uh, fire and brimstone uh, that comes from heaven. And this um, is described in Genesis chapter 19, uh, verse 24, Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. And so it's um, likely that there is an idiom here that the fire of eternity or fire from eternity is what's mentioned at the end of Jude 7, uh, suffering the justice, literally not vengeance, but the justice, it's the word decay there, uh, justice of eternal fire or the fire from eternity. It would be the same as saying the fire from the heavens. And so that uh, indicates and fits the context where all of these judgments are that are illustrated are judgments in time for disobedience to God, and that's what Jude is is uh, arguing for. Now, next time, when we come back in the next lesson, we're going to go forward in Jude to the next verse in verse 8 and 9, where we begin to talk about... Um, the characteristics of these false teachers in terms of their rejection of authority. So that is also tied back to what happens with the Israelites in verse 5, with these angels in verse 6, and with those in Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 7. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study these things today and to uh, be reminded of the importance of obedience to you and uh, the characteristics of uh, disobedience and rebellion always leads to uh, uh, failure and crisis and 
ultimately divine judgment. Father, we pray that you would help us to stand firm as we contend for the faith. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.